When I discovered the idea of continuous learning, I thought it was a miracle. I came from a poor home where we never had any money. When I left school without graduating, my first job was washing dishes in the back of a small hotel. When I lost that job, I got a job washing cars in the wintertime, you know what that's like. When I lost that job, I got a job washing floors with a janitorial service, and I thought washing was in my future. So I traveled and worked on farms, in construction, at laboring jobs, digging wells, in factories stacking lumber, on a ship in the North Atlantic, and at various other laboring jobs until I was 23 years old. And when I could no longer get a laboring job, like many people here, I got a job in sales. And in sales, I was a complete failure because I had no training. So, for six months, I worked and worked and worked, and I was making no success at all. I say starting off in sales with no skills is a wonderful weight loss program. Because if you don't sell, you don't eat. And I lost a lot of weight in those six months. Well, this whole thing about finding your passion is motivational claptrap. The way that you find your passion is whatever job you have to do. Throw your whole heart into it. And this has been discovered for centuries. Throw your whole heart into what you're doing, and you'll find out very quickly if this is the right work for you. If it's not, you won't get any excitement or happiness from it, and something will change. Many people don't realize that until you throw your whole heart into something, you don't get anything back. And so, what they do, is they say, Well, I'll try this and see if it works. I read this wonderful line two weeks ago. Every so often I come across a great line. It said, This work is never fun until you're good at it. And so, when you begin at a job, it may take you a year or two of hard work to become good at what you're doing, and it becomes fun. Then, it becomes your passion. And maybe we say, Oh, find my passion, find my passion. No, do your job right. Do it really well and get really good at it. And if when you're really good at it, if you still don't enjoy it, then look for something else. Tap your creative potential. Accept the fact that every single human being is a genius, and all successful men and women are creative. They're creative in that they respond to their world differently. They ask questions. They're flexible. They're curious. You know what the hallmark of creativity is? Curiosity. The hallmark of ignorance and stupidity is the cessation or stopping from asking questions. I've worked with some of the brightest men and women in this nation, and I find that the smartest people of all, the ones that have the greatest education and the most experience, are the ones who ask the most questions. They ask questions almost as if they were children. But they never stop asking questions. They're very open and flexible, and they have the ability once they learn a new piece of information to drop what they're doing, if the new information contradicts it, and do something else. You know what most people do? Most people keep on doing what they're doing until they run to a wall, as they say. The more you do what you're doing, the more you'll get of what you've got. Someone reported out to me not long ago, and I think it's very true, is that all changes in our life come with the input of new information. That if we do not have new information, that if we do not have new information, we keep on doing the same thing forever as a result of inertia. And creative people are always looking for faster, better, easier, cheaper, newer ways to do things. Remember, 80% of everything that we are doing today, and are doing today in our general business, will be different five years from now. 80% of the products that we use, the food that we eat, the cars we drive, the music we listen to, the movies we go to, even the streets we drive on, 80% of everything will be new in five years. That's how rapidly things are changing. Warren Buffett spends 80% of his time studying every day, and he's one of the richest people in the history of the world because he keeps learning new things. When I came across continuous learning, almost like tripping over something in the dark, I couldn't believe it. What it said was that you can learn anything you need to learn to achieve any goal you can set for yourself. There are no limitations on what you could learn. You have more potential than that you could use in a hundred lifetimes. You can learn anything. This, to me, was the greatest of all discoveries. There are no limits on the kind of life you can have because you can learn anything you need to learn. As long as you continuously learn new things. And what's the magic formula? Ten hours a week. Read a little bit each day in your field. Listen to audio programs when you travel around. Go to seminars and take notes. Write down actions that you can take immediately afterwards. And just dedicate your life to becoming a student for the rest of your life. Every day, you should be learning something new. Learning should be as much a part of your life as eating, sleeping, and breathing. 
And if you'll do that, you start to go up the ladder of success faster and faster. You feel happier and happier. People respect you and look up to you. You feel that you have more energy, and your self-esteem goes up. Your self-image improves, and you get it all from continuous learning. Which is why these people go from the bottom to the top, and they're very happy people. They're very highly respected, and they feel wonderful about themselves because growing and becoming better in your field is one of the most happiest and wonderful things you can do. Here are the keys to continuous learning. First of all, read 60 minutes a day. I will say this over and over again, 60 minutes per day, over the course of a year, two years, three years, will make you one of the top people in your field. Listen to audio cassettes in your car. Listen to audio cassettes. Here's what most people don't realize. They don't realize that they are not on vacation when they're in their car. If they're traveling between calls and between clients or between customers, they're not on vacation when they get into their car. They're still working. And the worst thing you can do is turn your mind off and park it and listen to something that's chewing gum for the years. What you do when you're driving is you learn at the same time. Listen to audio programs in your car. Turn your car into a mobile classroom. Turn your car into a university on wheels. Now, a study at the University of California, USC, concluded that if you listen to educational audio programs in your car as you drive around, instead of listening to music, which we call chewing gum for the years, if you listen to audio programs, you'll get the equivalent of almost full-time university attendance. Except for one small point. When you go to the university, people have graduated from universities that I eventually did find that about 90 or 95 percent of what they teach you is not practical. It's theoretical. It's enjoyable. But it's useless in the real world. However, when you select educational audio programs on sales, communication, time management, goal setting for yourself, which you can stop and start if you like, you only select things that are valuable to you in the moment. So you get even more than a university education by turning your car into a classroom on wheels. You turn your car into a mobile learning machine. Human beings are very much like they have what is called a cybernetic guidance mechanism, like a guided missile. A guided missile is fired at the target, and even if the target moves, the missile takes feedback and adjusts its course and hits the target. You have a cybernetic mechanism where you are learning. You are a learning machine. The more activities you engage in, the faster you learn. And pretty soon, you become so smart that you can hit the target almost every time. You can learn new skills. But it's like a car. You cannot change a car's engine by changing the paint on the outside. You can learn new skills if you're ambitious and positive and you want to be more successful. And you're eager to learn and apply new ideas. There's no limit to what you can do. But your basic personality, that's like your eye color, it's like your height, it's even like your sex. You cannot change these. These are basic parts that are programmed into your personality. So don't try to change people. If people are lazy when they're young, they'll be lazy 50 years later. If people are dishonest, they'll be dishonest. If people are unorganized, they'll be unorganized. However, if they have good qualities, good ambitions, you can teach them all kinds of skills. Skills are very different from personality. Did you ever wonder, Ed, is that some people make far more in the world, where some people can be making one, two, three, four, five, ten times as much as another person doing the same job? Many times we see salespeople who are making ten times as much as a person next to them in the next desk, selling the same product, the same product under the same price, under the same competitive circumstances. Why does this happen? Well, about 30 years ago, as you know, I began studying and looking for the reasons for success and failure. And one of the things that I found is that there are formulas. There are specific methods applied and used by very successful people. And if you use the same methods, law of cause and effect, you start to get the same result. And the more I study it, the more I realize this, that everybody who's at the front of the line once started at the back of the line. But everybody who's doing well was once doing poorly. Everybody who was first was once last. How did they get to be first? And it's very simple. It is called the law of incremental improvement, the law of continuous improvement. It's a very simple thing. You see, most of us, with no education, no knowledge, no skills, we go to school, we learn how to read and write and so on, we start our jobs, and in our careers, we have the knowledge, we have no skills. Each time we start something new, we have to go back to the back of the line. Why do some people get to the front of the line? It's very simple, because they learn the things that the other people learn. Another one, 
It is really the way that every single person has gone from nothing to being successful is continuous learning. Continuous learning, I believe, is the most important single key to success. It's what makes America the greatest country in the world. Why? It's because you could come here with nothing. And by simply focusing clearly on what you want, and then finding out who else has gotten the same things you want, and then learning from what they did, and doing the same things over and over again, you'll eventually get the same result. In fact, the rule today is that continuous learning is the minimum requirement for success in a new field. Whatever field you're in today, if you do not engage in continuous learning the same way you brush your teeth every day, you take a shower every day, if you don't engage in continuous learning every day, what will happen is that you'll be passed by by the people who do. In America today, an incredible shift has taken place. The shift is between those who know more and those who know less. We no longer live in a physical economy. We live in a mental economy. We live in an economy where brain power is the critical tool for earning a great living. And continuous learning is the only way to continue building your brain power. Attend every seminar possible. Get all the training you can. And of course, listen at every opportunity. You'll learn more in a few weeks watching this network than you might learn in years trying to pick it up by yourself. There's a rule that your television can make you rich or it can make you poor. It can make you rich if you turn it off, and it's made you poor if you turn it on. Years of research, this is my subject, shows that the more you watch television, the lower your income, unless you watch television, the higher your income. And it's always a choice you make anyway. So, two hours a night would work out to about a book a week plus other things. And then during the day, practice the things you learn. And pretty soon, you move on to the fast track. Pretty soon you start to move ahead of everybody else in your career. Pretty soon you start to become much more valuable, your earning ability goes up. So, I want you to think of a ladder of success and imagine a ladder. And each rung on the ladder is a new skill. The rule is, you cannot achieve a new goal without learning a new skill. So, each one is a new skill. Each time you master a skill, you move up the ladder, and your income goes up. And then you learn a new skill. And this is what they would do. They would work for a month, or three months. Or a year, however long it took to become excellent in a single skill. They would not try to become excellent in multiple skills, just one skill. And then once they had mastered that skill and people said, you know, you're pretty good at that, that would be their signal. Now what's my next skill? And they would work on the next skill take the next step, and the next step, and they would just keep climbing the ladder of success. Now, if ever you stop climbing the ladder, do you know what happens? You level off, and then you begin to decline because your existing skills become obsolete at a faster rate today than ever before. So, you keep climbing the ladder. If you stop, other people who are climbing their ladders will go past you, and pretty soon, you'll fall so far behind, it's like you're in a marathon. Let's say you're in a marathon with lots of runners, and you decide, well, you're going to stop and you're just going to stroll for a while, you're just going to stroll for a while, you're just going to rest, you don't want to work too hard, and then you decide, well, I think I'll start running again. What happens? You never catch up because the other people just kept on running. They're so far ahead of you, you never catch up. Now these seem like very simple explanations, but they do describe success versus failure. Now here's the interesting thing. Life is very much like a marathon. We all start off with the same line. We're all ready to go, and we start running. Everybody's got pretty much the same abilities and the same opportunities. We go to the same schools, we go to the same colleges. And yet some people get way, way ahead. The masses stay in the middle, and some people fall so far behind. They think they're first. And so, why is this? Well, this has been studied for year after year. And we find this one single difference, just the way you think. I was listening to somebody who grew up in a small town, and he was talking about this interesting point. He said he came from a poor family, and there were three families in that town that owned everything. They owned the mill, and they owned the factory, and they owned the general store, and they owned the shipping, and they owned the trucking, and they owned the agricultural processing. They owned everything. And these three families were rich. They had beautiful homes. Everybody revered them and talked about them. They were on the bank boards and everything else. And he went to school with the kids from these three families. And you know, everybody wanted to be their friends. Of course, you remember those days. And he found they're quite normal kids. They weren't very different from anybody else. But somehow, 
These families owned everything. And it was a real shock to him. It wasn't their education because they weren't getting a better education than he was. It wasn't their grades because the grades were the same. It certainly wasn't their physical attractions or anything else. It was just one thing. If they thought differently, they had an attitude of looking for opportunities and possibilities. And what we have found in a series of articles in Inkier magazine, they were interviewing people who'd become fabulously successful, rags to riches stories. Every one of them said the only reason I succeeded is because I developed the habit of always looking for the opportunity, always looking for something good or positive in what I was doing. Whereas other people, they have a setback. Oh my God. And they go home and drink and watch television and so on. But successful people are always looking for the opportunity. They think differently. So, when you learn to think better, you make better decisions. You get better results. The law of cause and effect says that for every effect in your life, there's a cause. Everything happens for a reason. Even if you don't know the reason, there's a reason. If somebody's practice is twice as large as somebody else's practice, it's not because of you or your genetics or your DNA or your chromosomes or anything else. It's just because they're doing something different, that's all. So, what you do is if you can define the effect that you want in your life, and then what you do is you trace it back to someone who at one time was earning less than you, and who's now earning twice as much. And then you find out what they did. You come here and you ask Ed and his people and they'll tell you. And then you do the same thing. You see success leads tracks, leaves tracks. You just do the same thing, and you get to the same place. Which brings us to one of the great rules of success. If you do what other successful people do over and over again until it becomes a habit, nothing in the world can stop you from getting the same results that they do. And if you don't, nothing can help you. Now this is a very important point to understand. All success skills are learnable. All practice development and management skills are learnable skills. All sales skills are learnable. All public relations skills are learnable. Their all physical and mental skills are learnable. You may not be able to play a classical violin or dunk baskets like Michael Jordan, but all business and sales and management skills are learnable skills. And so therefore you can learn any skill you need to learn in order to achieve any goal that you want. And once you understand that, for me, that happened to me when I was 23. The dam broke when I learned this law of cause and effect. Leave it. My God, you could learn to be successful. So, I'm going to teach you a go-forward word. And this is the word that you're going to use for the rest of your career. This is the word that will guarantee that you'll get onto the fast track in life. You'll increase your income at a more rapid rate than the average person, and you'll take complete control of your life. And the word is how. You want to double your income? The only question you ask is how. You want to double the number of patients coming to your practice? Your question is how. You want to double your profitability? The question is how. Your question is how to solve a problem. The question is how. Now whenever you ask the question how, it's like stepping on the accelerator of your own creative mind. You step in, and it throws off ideas like those little lightning strikes in the cartoons or the light bulbs, and every idea is for an action that you can take right now. Whenever you ask the question how, you get ideas. And the interesting thing is, they did a study at Harvard. They found that the greatest single predictor of success, especially financial success in life, is creativity. And creativity is determined by the number of ideas you come up with. And you'll find that the more ideas you come up with, because of the law of probabilities, the more likely it is you come up with a great idea. No matter what has happened in the past, the future is unlimited. It's only limited by your imagination. And here are my three predictions for you. Number one, you are going to make more money in the future than you have ever made in your life before. The financial possibilities for you in the future are unlimited. Number two, you're going to have greater happiness and success in the future than you have ever had in your life today. And number three, your greatest achievements in life lie in the future. And the future is limited only by your own imagination. So, there is no limit to what you can be and do in the future. Thank you. You are a self-made man or woman because you are where you are and what you are due to the thoughts that you have allowed to preoccupy your mind. Whatever you have dwelled upon over the months and years, you have become and you are right now, today. Your thoughts are the guidance mechanism of your life, so control your thoughts. When you control your thoughts, your feelings are determined. It is the thought that creates the feeling. It's how you think about something that has happened in your life that triggers the emotion. 
The way you explain things to yourself largely determines your emotions, thoughts, reactions, responses, and ultimately, the total quality of your life. We become worried, tearful, concerned, and anxious, or on the other hand, happy and inspired. Things happen, and we react, thinking and saying, well, of course, I'm upset. You'd be upset too if you had the same experiences. Life is a continuous reaction to outside stimuli for the average person. One may feel happy or sad, or that life has meaning or is meaningless, by evidence of what happens to us from day to day. But if you don't want to be upset, you needn't be. The incident happens. There's no use denying it. But as far as your experience is concerned, the incident is completely external. It's always on the outside. What happens in your mind happens as a result of your attitudes, feelings, and habit patterns. Your thoughts are your reactions to the incident, always. The incident did not make the thought. It is your mind, and you have been thinking and reacting in thought according to the level of your consciousness. Remember the last time you said, He makes me so mad. Or, That just teases me off. Of course this is not correct at all. No one ever makes you mad. No one ever gets you upset. You're upset because you're upset table. You're angry because you have an anger consciousness that is touched like a little red button that causes it to blow up within yourself. But the anger is already within. Someone says something about you that you don't like. Someone behaves towards you in a way that you find offensive. Somebody does something or says something to you that you feel hurt by. And out of you comes anger, hatred, bitterness, tension, fear, anxiety, stress. And immediately, you say the reason that comes out of me is because of how he said it or the way that she said that, or because they did that. But the truth is, the reality is, that what comes out is what's inside. So, you react in thinking according to the level of your attitudes, according to your consciousness. Some of us are completely unaware of the fact that we have the power to control the kind of thoughts that run rampant in our minds, to realize that it is your mind. Therefore, you have to ask yourself the question from time to time, when you find yourself terribly upset, concerned, anxious, or worried about something that's happened. Take a good look at yourself and ask yourself this one question. Why do I allow people or experiences or things to determine how I'm going to think or feel or act? In the same way, we're susceptible to the programming of mass media that is designed especially to control and influence thought. Simply because we've allowed ourselves to react, we are led into a life that is not really our own at all. We don't live our lives. We live lives that are conditioned by outside stimuli. But that's because we refuse to accept the responsibility for our own thoughts. So, the very first step in this process that we're calling the art of thinking, is to know that no matter what happens in your world, no matter what happens out there, no matter what you read in the papers, no matter what is taking place around you or to you, you always have a choice. Your anger is your choice, and you can always choose to be happy, angry, depressed, miserable, upset, or fulfilled. In this moment, it's always up to you. You can choose to think positively or creatively. You can become the master instead of the slave. It's not easy to think happiness when you're unhappy, because your unhappiness is busy manufacturing more unhappy thoughts. We're busy manufacturing negative thoughts to fulfill the negative state of consciousness. And it goes round and round. It's a vicious cycle. But, as I say so often, you don't have to have anything to be happy about ever. You can be happy simply because you want to be happy. Abraham Lincoln once said, A man is about as happy as he makes up his mind to be. This is the key to the positive life, the key to positive thinking. Simply determining that you have control, and you can think the kind of thoughts that you want to think, and making the commitment at the beginning of the day and, uh, regularly through the day, that you're not going to allow people or conditions or circumstances to decide how you're going to think or feel. Fact is, you always have a choice, and this is a very important realization. You better not read the news for a while, and you keep yourself in perfect peace and develop the capacity to control your own thoughts. Then you can read the news and listen to the news and see what's going on in the world, saying that the world has problems today but not I have problems. The world has problems, then suddenly you're in a state of consciousness where you can be a creative asset to the world, but at least you're not going to be destroyed by it. If you'll give it a good try, it will completely change your life for the better. Now I'll try to outline the 30-day test. I want you to make, now, 
Keep in mind that you have nothing to lose by making this test and everything you could possibly want to gain. First, it's understanding emotionally as well as intellectually that we literally become what we think about, that we must control our thoughts if we're to control our lives. I want you to write on a card what it is you want more than anything else. Make sure it's a single goal and clearly defined. You needn't show it to anyone, but carry it with you so that you can look at it several times a day. Think about it in a cheerful, relaxed, positive way each morning when you get up. And immediately, you have something to work for, something to get out of bed for, something to live for. Look at it every chance you get during the day, and just before going to bed at night, as you look at it. Remember that you must become what you think about. And since you're thinking about your goal, you realize that soon it will be yours. Thinking about what it is you fear. Each time a fearful or negative thought comes into your consciousness, replace it with a mental picture of your positive and worthwhile goal. There will come times when you'll feel like giving up. It's easier for a human being to think negatively than positively. That's why only 5% are successful. You must begin now to place yourself in that group. Don't concern yourself too much with how you're going to achieve your goal. Leave that completely to a power greater than yourself. All you have to do is know where you're going. The answers will come to you of their own accord. For 30 days, do your best. If you should fail during your first 30 days, by that I mean suddenly find yourself overwhelmed by negative thoughts, you've got to start over again from that point and go 30 more days. Gradually, your new habit will form until you find yourself one of that wonderful minority to whom virtually nothing is impossible. Don't forget the card. It's vitally important as you begin this new way of living. In your spare time, during your test period, read books that will help you. Inspirational books like Dorothea Brandy's Wake Up and Live, The Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and other books that instruct and inspire. Nothing great was ever accomplished without inspiration. Above all, don't worry. Worry brings fear, and fear is crippling. The only thing that can cause you to worry during your test is trying to do it all yourself. Know that all you have to do is hold your goal before you. Everything else will take care of itself. Remember also to keep calm and cheerful. Don't let petty things annoy you or get you off course. Remember that you must reap that which you sow. If you sow negative thoughts, your life will be filled with negative things. If you sow positive thoughts, your life will be cheerful, successful, and positive. Live this new way and the floodgates of abundance will open and pour over you more riches than you may have dreamed existed. Money. Yes, lots of it. But what's more important, you'll have peace. You'll be in that wonderful minority who lead calm, cheerful, successful lives. I want to talk to you today about one of the most important single aspects of success of all kinds. Success in love, success in money, success in health, success in every area of your life. And it's what you've heard of called a positive mental attitude. A positive mental attitude is a generally constructive response to the stresses that face the average person every single day. A positive attitude is where you feel that you have the ability to control your world and to control your life. A positive attitude is like a chicken and egg thing. If you're successful, you're positive. If you're positive, you're successful. Which comes first? It doesn't really matter. But we know this. Positive thinkers are men and women who accomplish an awful lot more than people who have negative mental attitudes. Your job is to develop a positive mental attitude. Your job is to become thoroughly positive and constructive towards yourself and your possibilities and the world around you and the people in your life. And the way you do this is very much the same way you develop physical fitness. Now if I were to say to you that if you go to a gym and you work out on a regular basis, an hour, an hour and a half a day, and you do this every day for 30 days, and you match that with a proper diet, that you'll actually see a difference in yourself physically. If I were to say that to you, you'd say, oh, of course. Anybody knows that if you worked out steadily for 30 days, you'd notice the difference. Well, it's the same thing with mental fitness. So, I'm going to ask you to do this for me. I'm going to give you seven steps. Seven things that you can do. Seven things that have been proven to work. What I'm going to ask you to do is that you practice these seven steps for 21 days. The reason for this is it takes 21 days to develop a new habit pattern of any kind. If you work on a habit pattern and you practice it every day, you'll begin to develop new neural grooves in your brain that cause you to think and act more optimistically automatically. You get up in the morning feeling better, you are more positive toward the challenges you face during the day, 
You're more optimistic in the face of adversity, you start to become a more competent and optimistic person. And when you do, you'll find your whole life will open up around you like sunshine on a bright morning. These seven basic steps to mental fitness. If you practice all of these steps together, what will happen to you is incredible. But here's the first rule, and this is the rule that runs through everything, and it is this. Remember that everything counts. Everything that you do counts. The biggest mistake that people make is they think that only what they want to count counts. If you read a book, if you listen to an audio program, if you go to a course, if you go to bed early and get up early, and you work, it all counts, and it's all going on the plus side of your ledger. But when you watch television, waste time, hang out, fool around and so on, all of that counts as well, and it's going on the negative side of your ledger. And here's an important point. If what you are doing is not moving you towards your goals, then it's probably moving you away from your goals. Nothing is neutral. Everything that you're doing is either moving you towards the things that you want to accomplish in life, the person you want to be, the wealth you want to accumulate, or it's moving you away. Everything counts, and your job is to remember that everything we talk about counts. It affects you one way or the other, and your job is to use every single one of these as often as you can. In 21 days, you won't even notice the difference. You'll be so astonished at yourself. Number one is positive self-talk. Positive self-talk means that you are optimistic in your conversation with yourself. What we have found is that 95% of your emotions, how you feel about yourself on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, are determined by the way you talk to yourself. This is called your inner dialogue. It's the stream of words and thoughts and feelings that course through your day like a river going through your mind. The sad fact is, if you do not deliberately and consciously talk to yourself in a positive and constructive way, you will, by default, think about things that will make you unhappier, because you worry and anxiety. Remember, your mind is like a vacuum, it will not remain empty. If you don't fill it with positive thoughts, it will fill with negative thoughts, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your mind is like a gardener. If you do not deliberately plant flowers and tend them carefully, weeds will grow without any encouragement at all. If you don't think positive thoughts and take good care of them, negative thoughts will grow in your mental garden without any effort on your part. We also know that there is a concept in cognitive psychology called explanatory style. Explanatory style has to do with how you explain things to yourself. We know that successful people, positive people, are those who explain things to themselves in a positive way. They say, well that's an interesting situation, or that'll work out okay, or don't worry about it, everything is going to happen for a good reason, and so on. Positive people are those who constantly take what is happening and interpret them differently, explain them differently. Positive people turn them around and explain them well. W. Clement Stone, one of the richest men in the world, said that one of the keys to his success was to look at every adversity and immediately say, that's good, and then to find something in it that was good. So, the second part of positive self-talk is to control your inner dialogue. And here's the key to positive self-talk. It's one of the most important parts of modern psychology, and it's the use of affirmations. Now affirmations are positive statements that you make to yourself about yourself and your world. My favorites are, I like myself, I can do it, I feel terrific, I am responsible. This is how top people think most of the time. Affirmations are the key. With affirmations, your potential as a person is unlimited. The discovery of affirmations and the development of affirmations as a science has been one of the greatest breakthrough areas in human potential. If I can give you one secret of success, it would be this. Talk about the things you want, and refuse to talk about the things you don't want. It's to talk continually in terms of what you want to happen, to interpret things continually in terms of the way you want them to be, and to continually control your inner dialogue so you're always saying the things to yourself and then to others that are consistent with the person you want to be and the life that you want to have. Remember, 95% of your feelings are determined by the way you talk to yourself. It's absolutely essential that you talk to yourself the way that you want to be. The second key is positive visualization. Perhaps the most powerful ability that you have is the ability to visualize and to see your goals as already accomplished. Do your life as ideal in every way. The way you do this is you create a clear, exciting picture of your goal and your ideal life, and replay this picture on the screen of your mind over and over again. The rule is that all improvement in your outer life begins with an improvement in your mental pictures. 
and you completely control the pictures that you play on the screen of your mind. As you see yourself on the inside, you will start to be that person with those accomplishments on the outside. If you see yourself and think about yourself as an extraordinary person, if you see yourself as a success, if you see yourself as happy and positive and confident and in control, if you see yourself as a loving parent or spouse, you will act that way toward others. Therefore, all improvement in your life begins with an improvement in your mental pictures, with you consciously and deliberately selecting the pictures that you're going to allow your mind to dwell upon. And that word dwell is terribly important. When you dwell upon a picture, your subconscious mind, just as with affirmations, accepts the picture as a command and goes to work to bring that picture into your reality. It's the most phenomenal thing. Your subconscious mind controls your reticular activating system or your reticular cortex as well. Your reticular activating system is very interesting. It's a small part of your brain that controls all incoming impulses. Let me give you an example. If you've ever thought that you're going to buy a red sports car, you send a signal to your brain that red sports cars are now important to you. Your reticular activating system suddenly activates all of your senses so that wherever you go, you see red sports cars. Every time you turn around, you see them turning the corner. You see them parked. You see them in parking lots. You see them in newspapers and magazines. You see them everywhere. If you begin to tell your brain that you intend to be a great success in your field, that you are going to move to the top, that you're going to be one of the most respected people in what you do, if you're going to make a lot of money, whatever it happens to be, this is accepted as a command. The reticular cortex switches on all these switches, and from then on, you begin to see all kinds of possibilities that help you move toward achieving that goal. Why is it that successful people move so rapidly toward achieving their goals? It's very simple. It's because they're thinking all the time, and as a result of thinking about what they want, they see all kinds of opportunities around them to achieve that. The average person doesn't even see because the average person is so worried about how much money they have and how much their bills are, all the problems they have. The more they think about those things, the more they get them. So, with regard to positive visualization, see yourself as you desire, and what will happen is your subconscious mind will say, well, this must be a command, this must be what you want. So it goes to work and coordinates your words, actions, thoughts, activities, emotions and so on, so they're consistent with achieving and bringing that mental picture into your reality. If you interview successful people, and you ask them on a regular basis what they think about, what are you thinking about now? You'll find that successful people are always thinking constructive, positive, creative thoughts that help them to be more successful. And if you interview negative people who aren't doing very much with their lives, you ask them what are they thinking about? They're always thinking about negative, hurtful, destructive, angry, resentful, worry thoughts. And surprise, surprise, the more they think about them and worry about them, the more they draw them into their lives. Be careful. Your mind is very, very powerful. The next technique, number three, is positive mental food. Just as your body is healthy to the degree to which you eat healthy, nutritious foods, your mind is healthy to the degree to which you feed it with mental protein rather than mental candy. Read books, magazines, and articles that are educational, inspirational, or motivational. Feed your mind with information and ideas that are uplifting and that make you feel happy and more confident about yourself and your world. Listen to positive, constructive CDs and audio programs in your car and on your MP3 player or iPod. Feed your mind continually with positive messages that help you think and act better and make you more capable and competent in your field. Watch positive and educational DVDs, educational television programs, online courses, and other uplifting, enriching material that increases your knowledge and makes you feel good about yourself and your life. Did you know that every time you learn something new that you feel can help improve your life, your brain releases endorphins, which are called nature's happy drug, and you actually feel happier even before you take action on a new piece of idea? You feel happier that you have learned a new idea in the first place. Just as we said before, you become what you think about. If I were to say to you, there's a remarkable discovery. Did you know that you become what you eat? That your food determines your physical health? If I were to say that to you, you'd say, Ah, give me a break, Brian. Everybody knows you become what you eat. And the problem is, we just don't eat the things that we should. Positive mental food is exactly the same. You become what you think about most of the time. In other words, your whole life today, everything around you, 
has been determined by what you think about most of the time. Now, if you think about positive, constructive, success-oriented, happy things, you start to have more of those in your life. If you think about movies, television, sports, and waste your time socializing, well, you'll have a lot of those in your life, but you won't have anything else. Remember, whatever you think about most of the time crowds the other things out of your life. So, in becoming what you think about, what do you feed your mind on a regular basis? And this is not something that you are casual about. You must be very, very deliberate and feed your mind a diet of mental protein, of highly nutritious words, pictures, quotes, magazines, television, audio tapes, books, newspapers, and so on. Let me ask you a question. What do you think would happen to you if you read a whole lot of horror books or a whole lot of murder books? What do you think would happen to you who read these books all the time? Do you think what affects your mind? You contribute affects your mind. What do successful people read? They read books that are positive and constructive and success-oriented and uplifting and educational and motivational. Your job is to ask yourself, when you look at a book, is this going to help you in some way? If you read all the negative stories in newspapers day after day after day, you get the idea by the way that our whole society is falling apart. If you read negative stories in magazines, you get the same thing. Things that you feed into your mind have such an enormous impact on your mind. Make sure that what you're listening to, what you're watching, what you're hearing, is consistent with what you want to accomplish. Now the fourth part of mental programming, the fourth part, is positive people. Your choice of the people with whom you live and work and associate will have more of an impact on your emotions and your success than any other factor. Why is this? It's because they control your self-talk and your mental pictures. Now, decide today to associate with winners, with positive people, with people who are happy and optimistic and who are going somewhere with their lives. Extensive studies at Harvard came up with an expression called your reference group. Your reference group are the people that you think yourself should be like. When you're growing up, your first reference group is your family. Then it's your school. And then you grow up and you join clubs and associates. And sometimes you go to church or eventually join a political party or you join a career. And each time, the people in that field are your reference group. You have to think about this question. What people do you most identify with? What people do you most consider yourself to be like? They're like me. I'm like them. What do we know about high-performing men and women? Is that their reference group from a very early age are the most successful people in their field. They're the most admirable people. They're the most positive people. They're the kind of people that they admire and want to be like. What is your reference group? Who do you socialize with? Who do you go for lunch with? Who do you go out for dinner with? Who do you like to read about, talk about? Who is your reference group? Because it will determine your life and your success as much as anything else. And your reference group has got to be winners. Get around winners. Imagine waking up each morning to the dawn, where the first light of day touches the sky, painting it with hues of orange and pink. In this quiet hour, when the world is still asleep, there's a story that begins, a story of transformation and triumph, that starts with the simple act of setting intentions for the day. Let me share with you the story of Jordan. Jordan was like many of us, troubling to find direction, feeling overwhelmed by life's demands, and all too often hitting the snooze button, letting precious mornings slip away. But then something changed. Jordan discovered the transformative power of starting the day with purpose and dedication to personal development and goal setting. Instead of scrolling through social media or rushing out the door, Jordan began dedicating time to visualize goals, to read, to reflect, and to plan. This shift didn't just change mornings, it changed Jordan's life. Goals became clear, actions became intentional, and the impossible suddenly seemed within reach. Now you might wonder, why is the morning so crucial? Why does winning the morning mean winning the day? The answer lies in the stillness of the morning, the opportunity it presents for clarity and focus before the demands of the day take hold. Successful individuals across the globe harness this time not because it's easy, but because they understand the immense power it holds. It's the time when you can set the tone for your day, align your actions with your goals, and create a momentum that carries you forward. Consider this. How often do we let our mornings dictate our days, rather than dictating our mornings to shape our days? The truth is, the morning offers a fresh start, a reset button that we get to press every single day. 
It's an unparalleled opportunity to focus on what truly matters before the world starts pulling us in a thousand different directions. But what stops us from making the most of our mornings? Is it the comfort of our beds, the lure of just a few more minutes of sleep, or perhaps the belief that our days are already set in motion beyond our control? The reality is, each new day brings a new choice. A choice to rise with purpose, or to let the day unfold by chance. The secret to transforming your life, like Jordan did, begins the moment you decide to take control of your mornings. It's about creating a morning routine that energizes you, inspires you, and prepares you for the day ahead. It's about dedicating time to your personal growth, to setting your intentions, and most importantly, to taking action towards your dreams, one morning at a time. So, I encourage you to ask yourself, what will you do tomorrow morning to win the day? The answer to that question, my friends, could very well be the first step in your own story of transformation. In the stillness of the morning, when the world is yet to awaken, lies the golden hour for setting the stage for success. Imagine greeting the day with a clear vision of what you wish to achieve, painting the canvas of your day with the colors of your aspirations. This isn't just an ideal. It's a practice that can transform your life, one morning at a time. Consider the power of visualization and goal setting as your first brushstroke. Every morning, take a moment to close your eyes and envision the life you're working towards. By visualizing your goals, you're programming your mind to recognize the opportunities that will move you closer to your aspirations. And with each morning, by setting daily objectives that align with your long-term goals, you're laying down the stepping stones on your path to success. It's about turning the someday into the day, making each day a purposeful stride towards your dreams. Now, weaving the thread of personal development into our morning tapestry offers a sacred space for growth and learning. Whether it's diving into a book that challenges your thinking, listening to a podcast that inspires you, or practicing a skill that sharpens your expertise, dedicating time each morning to personal growth fuels not just your mind, but your soul. It's an investment in yourself that pays dividends beyond measure, propelling you towards excellence and fulfillment. Moreover, Acknowledging the profound connection between physical well-being and mental clarity, integrating exercise into your morning routine is like setting the rhythm for your day's symphony. Whether it's a brisk walk, a series of stretches, or a dance under the open sky, physical activity energizes the body and clears the mind. It's about waking up to the vitality of life, readying yourself to face the day's challenges with resilience and vigor. This commitment to exercise and well-being is a testament to self-respect. A message you send to yourself that you're worth the effort, that your health and happiness are paramount. This holistic approach to mornings, encompassing visualization, personal development, and physical wellness, sets a powerful precedent for the day. Imagine, as the sun climbs higher, you're already aligned with your purpose, enriched with new insights, and invigorated by the life coursing through your veins. This isn't just the blueprint of a winning morning, it's the foundation of a winning life. So, I ask you, what steps will you take tomorrow morning to paint your day with purpose and passion? The canvas is yours, and the brushstrokes of visualization, personal growth, and well-being are within your grasp. Embrace these practices, not just for the promise of success they hold, but for the fulfillment and joy they bring into each day. Remember, the journey to greatness begins with the first light of dawn. One of the first challenges we face each morning isn't just the sound of the alarm. It's the temptation to procrastinate. We all have that one task, perhaps more, that looms over us, heavy with anticipation. But what if I told you that tackling this Goliath first thing in the morning could not only set the tone for your day, but also transform your approach to challenges? By addressing our most daunting tasks at the start, we harness the fresh energy of a new day when our willpower is at its peak. This act doesn't just diminish the cloud of procrastination, but also instills a sense of achievement early on. It's like climbing a mountain before breakfast. Imagine what else you could accomplish before the day ends. Now, shift our focus to a powerful catalyst for change. Gratitude. Imagine starting each day not with a recount of worries or a to-do list, but with a moment of gratitude. This simple act of acknowledging the good in our lives, the blessings both big and small, can dramatically alter our perspective. It's about seeing the glass not just as half full, but as a vessel of endless possibilities. Gratitude ignites positivity, which in turn lights up the path we walk each day. It attracts more positivity, setting a cycle of goodness in motion. 
Consider this. What if each morning you could write down three things you're grateful for? Watch how this practice shifts your focus from what's lacking to what's abundant in your life. As we embrace gratitude, let's not forget the cornerstone of personal growth, continuous learning. The dawn of each day brings with it the opportunity to learn something new, to stretch the boundaries of our knowledge and skills. This commitment to learning isn't just about accumulating facts. It's about embracing a mindset of growth and adaptability. In a world that's constantly evolving, staying rooted in the habit of learning ensures we remain relevant, agile, and forward-moving. Whether it's a new language, a piece of historical wisdom, or a skill that enhances our work, dedicating time each morning to learning sets us on a path of perpetual growth. It's about becoming a student of life, where each day is a classroom and every experience a lesson. Imagine integrating these practices into your mornings, overcoming procrastination by embracing your biggest challenges head-on, cultivating an attitude of gratitude that fosters positivity, and committing to continuous learning as a lifelong endeavor. These aren't just strategies for mastering your mornings. They are principles for mastering your life. Ask yourself, how can you apply these principles starting tomorrow morning? How can you transform your mindset before dawn to set the stage for a day of purpose, growth, and positivity? The answers to these questions lie within each of us, ready to be discovered with the rising sun. Not just to achieve success in the conventional sense, but to live a life enriched with learning, gratitude, and the courage to face our challenges head on. Remember, the mastery of your mornings is just the beginning. It's the mastery of your life that's the ultimate reward. And our journey towards personal and professional excellence begins with establishing rituals for success. These rituals aren't just beneficial, they're essential. The way we begin our day sets a precedent for everything that follows. So, let's lay down the first brick in the construction of our day with precision and purpose, ensuring that everything that stacks on top aligns with our goals and aspirations. Let's craft a personalized morning routine that ignites our passion, fuels our ambition, and prepares us to face the world with our brightest, most potent energy. And let's remember that as our world expands, our rituals must grow with us, providing a steadfast foundation no matter how far or fast we go. In our journey towards personal and professional excellence, establishing rituals for success isn't just beneficial, it's essential. The way we begin our day sets a precedent for everything that follows. So, let's lay down the first brick in the construction of our day with precision and purpose, ensuring that everything that stacks on top aligns with our goals and aspirations. Let's craft a personalized morning routine that ignites our passion, fuels our ambition, and prepares us to face the world with our brightest, most potent energy. And let's remember that as our world expands, our rituals must grow with us, providing a steadfast foundation no matter how far or fast we go. As we stand at the threshold of a new day, let's not forget that the journey to success, fulfillment, and personal growth begins the moment we decide to take charge of our mornings. It's not just about waking up early. It's about waking up to the possibilities that each new day holds. It's about making a conscious decision to cultivate habits and rituals that propel us towards our goals, turning the quiet of dawn into a powerful ally in our quest for achievement. Don't let another morning pass by as just another segment of time. Let tomorrow be the day you start transforming your life, one morning at a time. Begin by setting a simple goal for your morning, something that resonates with your aspirations. Whether it's reading a page of an inspiring book, jotting down three things you're grateful for, or dedicating 15 minutes to meditation or exercise, make it a non-negotiable part of your morning. Remember, the journey to greatness begins with the first light of the journey begins today.